Charlene Tate from the Western Professional Development Center. Welcome to season two of the Itsy Bitsy Zoomcast. We have lovingly titled this season the ABCs and HCCs of Early Childhood Education. We're using the letters HCC in the title of every episode to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Holyoke Community College. Today's episode is very near and dear to us with the HCCs being heart-centered collaboration. And I'd like to use this opportunity to take a moment to acknowledge my dear friend and colleague, Sheila Gould. She has been a shining light for me in my own professional and personal mission of heart-centered collaboration over this last year. Oh, Liz, that means a lot. Having this project is one of those little positive things that came out of the pandemic. It's not all doom and gloom. We've had a lot of joy, and this is a heart-centered collaboration for us, and it's important for me to bring more voices into the HCC practicum classroom. Um, so we're excited to have special guests joining us today, and we have Dr. June Lei Lee and Courtney Waring. Dr. Lee, could you tell our viewers a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, hi, Sheila. Hi, Liz. Thank you for hosting the conversation today. Um, so I'm Jun Lei Lee. Lee. Um, I'm a professor of early childhood education at uh, the Graduate School of Education here at Harvard University. Um, my work uh, is really focused on trying to understand um, the relationship between adults and children, um, uh, whether they're young or whether they're adolescents. Um, I think um, I, I was I grew up in China. I was born, born in China, but I spent actually most of my adult life uh, quite literally uh, in Mr. Rogers neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And, and so I think my interest probably had uh, a lot to do with uh, having studied child development in that environment. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rogers is fond of saying that 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 the space between two people is, is holy ground. And, 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 and whether that space is in person or whether that space is like what we have right now over, over a little screen. And, and so he was enormously interested in what happens in, inside that space. And I think that's very much what my teaching and my own research work has been about. Thank you for being here, Dr. Lee. We're excited to have found this virtual space to share our voices with our colleagues and our students. So thank you for being here. Courtney, can you share a bit about yourself as well? Sure. Hi, I'm Courtney Waring. I'm the Director of Education at the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art in Amherst, Massachusetts. And Jun Lei, I would love to be in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. That sounds fantastic. Um, at, at the Carl, our mission is to inspire a love of art um, and reading uh, through picture books. I've been there for eight wonderful years. Um, it's cr incredible working there with um, not only the team, but the, the collection and the, the programs and the artists and the authors that we work with. Um, I've been a museum educator for over 20 years. Um, and uh, thinking about connection and, and collaboration, I grew up um, in a small island in the Aleutian chain for 10 years. So we were very isolated and thinking about um, how important it was during my um, childhood to make connections wherever we can have them because it was such a small community um, was, was something that I noticed at a very early age. And I'm, I'm so happy that through the Carl and the community programs that we do, that we're still able to um, make those connections with guests and, and members of all ages. We miss working with HCC. I'm so glad that we can still connect with you virtually, but we've loved our partnerships with you these past three years, Sheila and Liz. It's been interesting because um, we've been working virtually during service learning and the students have been creating blogs for the Eric Carle Museum related to things. So even though we're not physically in the art room like we usually are, we have this different connection. Um, so it's, it's forced us to kind of learn some new skills to connect with each other. 
So speaking of connections and students, I'm gonna introduce my wonderful practicum students, Riley McLaughlin and Jessica Cardona. They worked with their peer, Alexandra Wallace, who can't be with us at the moment, but the three of them worked together to design this conversation. And what the students have been doing in practicum is they were looking at the Simple Interactions website, which will be in the show notes, and really thinking about their experience doing service learning and making connections with external agencies like the CARL, and really thinking about how connection and reciprocity and the tools from the Simple Interaction website can change how they view their interactions with children, but also colleagues in the greater community. So with that foundation set on heart-centered collaborations, I'm gonna turn this conversation over to the students because they have some really great questions for you. Um, Riley, could you ask the first question? Of course. Um, hello. Um, both of you are deeply invested in the power of relationships and connecting communities in meaningful ways. The title of this episode is Heart-Centered Collaborations. What does this title mean to you and the work you are most passionate about? Dr. Lee, do you want to answer first? Thank you, Riley, that's a, such a thoughtful um, uh, question. I think, um, I think sometimes um, we have a miss conception about what it means to have heart in something. Um, sometimes we think of, uh, you know, the heart and the brain as if they're two different things. Um, I think um, when I think of a phrase like heart-centered collaboration or just putting the heart to anything, I think I think of the heart as at the core of our very being, who we are. Um, all of our smarts and all of our questions and all of our feelings, all of that wrapped together um, becomes our heart. Um, Riley, you know, right, right before we um, started recording, you were telling me a little bit about what interested you in, in teaching. And you talked about how, you know, you were an assistant to your teacher starting in fifth grade. <laughs> and then, you know, as a young person, you coached uh, other people in gym gymnastics that that coaching you know being a teacher was very much kind of at the heart of, of who you are uh, even when you were little and, and and so when i think about what it means to connect with children build relationships with children and families or or building communities among teachers i think these relationships and interactions starts with the heart of, of who we are um, and I think, you know, often when I think of the relationships teachers and children have, or just any two human beings, I think two things have to happen. One is that, you know, you, the person or the teacher, have to bring who you are to that interaction. And so if you're in touch with your own heart, then there's more of you you can bring to that interaction. But at the same time, you know, the person in the interaction, we ought to be able to at least have the desire um, to look deep into the person that we're with, whether they're young or old, and trying to see their heart, trying to discover and find out who they are. And, and when that happens, we have a relationship. When two people bring their heart to uh, a particular interaction. So anyhow, um, in the work that I'm really excited about, um, I wanted to understand and see what these connections look like. I don't mean just in terms of philosophy or principle. I mean, in everyday practice, right? So when, when, when a teacher, you know, gets down on his or her knees and faces a crying child, like what happens in that, in those few seconds? What is it that the teacher brings out of themselves? And what is it that, that, that the child has been offered a space to be who the child is? And, and I think if that exchange of the hearts of people becomes part of the simple, ordinary interactions that we have day in and day out, I feel like there we have the foundation for relationship and weaving together these relationships, we have the foundation for community. So. That at least was how I was trying to connect together your question about heart-centered um, to this idea of building 
relationships, communities, and building collaborations across that. Thank you for that response. It, it means a lot to the students and they talk a lot about this. The word authenticity comes up a lot in class. And I think really understanding your own heart and being open to the hearts of the children really brings that authenticity through. So I, I just appreciate that, that response. Courtney, how about you? You're on mute for a sec, Courtney. That was so beautiful. I, I, this is very hard to follow, follow up with that, Jim Lee. I, I, I think the work that we do, yes, it's it's all about our heart. Um, you know, in all of my experiences as an educator, whether it was, you know, an assistant daycare teacher or a student teacher in a classroom, or now as a museum educator, my heart is full when I'm working with children, or if I'm working with my colleagues or community members in support of children and their needs. And Jun Lee, you were talking about the 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 heart that we give in this practice. And it just got me thinking too that there, there's a part of us giving our heart. So we have to also be mindful of the care that we that we give ourselves, <laughs> that we give our own heart through this. I think um, my, you know, my sister is a, a kindergarten teacher and we have a lot of discussions about um, what she's experiencing right now and some of her her joys, but also her challenges and um, just making sure that there's that space there to, to remember that, um, yes, that your heart is at the core. Um, and that's why we do this very important, inspiring work. Oh, what a great start to our conversation. Jessica, go ahead. You had a great question to follow up with that. As students at HCC, we make a lot of connections through service learning projects. For example, working with the Eric Carl Museum and creating the Itsy Bitsy episode. As we enter the workforce and as emerging teachers, we are focused on making connections on a micro level with children, families, and colleagues, but also on a macro level with our network. In what ways can teachers make and model meaningful connections at all levels? That's such a great question, Jessica. I, and I, as I was looking at the questions that you and Riley came up with, I, I was thinking, I, I wish that we just had more time and more people to have to have this discussion with more more voices and thoughts. Um, it, it got me thinking about, you know, at the Carl, we do um, something called a whole book approach story time. And in that story time, we're, we're introducing children to, you know, the art and the design of the book, where, um, you know, we're developing a child's visual literacy, building their oral language by talking about um, the story and what they think is going to happen. But we're also, we're also creating these spaces to share and through that, through creating those spaces to share, we're all also creating spaces to listen. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about what we see, what we think is going to happen in the story, we're bringing our own experiences and knowledge to it. And so for me, I think that's a really, that's a really special moment to create those spaces to share, um, to share part of yourself, for students to share with you, um, for, you know, for parents, community members to share. Um, so I think about this question of micro and macro level connections. I think creating those moments and spaces to share is very important um, and meaning and memorable. How about you, Dr. Lee? You know, um, that's such a good qu question. Um, Jessica, I'm glad you thought of it. I think it took me maybe 10 years of my career to start to shift my own thinking from you know the connection between adults and children to thinking about the macro level right thinking about the networks of adults um courtney you know um this morning i was um because i know you were here um i was uh re-watching the episode where mr uh rogers and eric carl were together and it's a beautiful moment but what really struck me was how they interacted with each other, um, how Eric was just, you know, just sharing the joy, right, of, of painting and drawing. And Mr. Uh, 
a, a Rogers almost had a childlike wonder being with Eric and, and, and just getting excited with, with, you know, how these colors get on the paper and how these paper then become books and so on. And um, I think what it reminded me something, you know, uh, where I, I teach, um, when I teach, um, I actually don't teach a course that's called, you know, child development, we call it human development. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember years ago when Mr. Uh, Rogers was interviewed, because she he studied child development as well. And um, he didn't say, I'm an expert in child development. He says, I'm a student of human development. And, and I think every word he uses, right, just like every color that Eric Kao uses, is very deliberate and, and, and intentional. And I think he have always tried to help people understand that, that, that the child is always part of us and that who we are has to do with who we are as children. And what that means when it comes to meaningful connections is that um, I, I feel like there's a simple principle that we can apply which is that no matter who we are interacting with, at what level, right, of our professional work, um, we can try to do for that person what we imagine the best preschool teachers do for children. Um, and, and, and if you just imagine the, you know, the, the most wonderful preschool teachers and then you think about that, the way that teacher get on the level of the child right how 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 that teacher listens how that teacher supports and guides and how that teacher makes sure that 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 whoever you are whether you are shy or whether you're outgoing there's a place for you in that community of the classroom um and that 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 teacher is always invested in how you want to learn and grow um if you think about all these things right i mean i can't imagine that a grown-up would say to any of those things that I don't need that. <laughs> like, like all grown-ups, right? We, we, we need a sense of connection. We need a sense that someone can hear us and that we need um, the sense that no matter who we are, we belong where we are. And that, that even as grown-ups, no matter how old we are, that we're still wanting to learn, wanting to grow um, in one and many aspects of our own lives. Um, so, so, you know, I, I just thought that was, I always thought of that as kind of rule of thumb, right? If, if I'm having trouble making a connection, I have to think about, well, what would the best preschool teacher do? Um, and, and, and then think about what, what form that would take, um, for an adult. Um, you know, Jessica, earlier we were talking about, you said, you know, you were drawn, um, to the work, um, of, of being a teacher for young, 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 young children off from your experience as a parent and, and from your experience of wanting better care for your own children. And so I can imagine that when you extend that care to other children, you would extend that care to other parents as well. Mm -hmm. And, and that you, you would appreciate how much not only do children need support, but parents need support. And, and that is one of the most beautiful things about early childhood edu education is that we always cared for the children, but we also cared about the adults around the children as well. And, and, and that, that if we interact with the grownups the way, um, at least in, in this, with the same principles in which we care for children, I think, I think we would do quite all right uh, across all levels of these connections. I love that you brought up a few topics that have been really prevalent with the practicum students this semester. Particularly, Jessica has been talking a lot about parents in her writing. I, I hope you don't mind that I share this, but in your writing, Jessica, you share a lot about what you notice about parents. Um, and that's such an important perspective for you to take with you into your career as you move to the next step. But something really amazing I've noticed about Riley and Jessica and the rest of my practicum students is that they've chosen to do their practicum in a pandemic. So they've had to very intentionally decide 
I will continue to grow. I will continue to learn and I will find a way to make connections even if it's virtual. Um, so I think that says a lot about who this particular group of students will be as they, as they enter the field and that they're gonna bring their heart with them um, in a really intentional way. So I think, you know, what, what Courtney and, and Dr. Lee, what you both shared plays right into what the conversations have been within our class. So I'm glad that we have them here in this conversation as well. The students, you know, oh, go ahead, Liz. I just wanted to say that, that what I, the word that keeps coming up for me when I listen to you speak is respect, that there's, when you have this kind of connection with another person, when you take the time to notice and listen, um, there's this loving respect that you're, that sort of goes between two people. And one of the things that has come up a lot in our episodes this semester has been around how to support people during this pandemic through it. And when we get to wherever we're going next and the message that uh, our guests have really wanted to deliver is how important it is that we maintain our relationships with each other and that we make connections with each other. And sometimes it can feel like what we need to do is big and overwhelming and hard, and maybe we're not equipped to do it. And listening to both of you, I'm just reminded and encouraged that we all possess the ability to stay connected to each other. We already have that skill set within us, and that just um, that's just so heartwarming. Usually on the episodes, we do two questions because we're supposed to be itsy bitsy, but <laughs> the students actually had a lot of questions and we were able to narrow it to three. So, um, Jessica's actually going to ask another question and that'll be our third one for today. <laughs> Would you share a personal story about the power of connection and how your beliefs have changed in this last year? I can start. Um, I think, um, Jessica, you know, you talked about how your role as a parent, right, lift, uh, you know, shifted into your role as an educator. I think my role of, of, of a parent certainly changed my direction as a teacher and a researcher as well. Um, I had uh, finished my graduate uh, work for, um, I was finishing my, my graduate uh, work when I became a dad um, through adoption. And uh, my oldest um, was adopted from an orphanage um, in China. And, um, and so, you know, I was already a researcher, so you can imagine what researchers do, right? So right before we adopted, I was pulling up all the research articles about, you know, what happens to children in the orphanages and what happens after they grow up. Um, and, and the research was not very optimistic, right? It talked about how, how difficult it, it would have been for children to grow, grow up in orphanages without their families and so on. Um, so I, I was adopting my first um, daughter from China, the country where I was born. And um, I was very excited, right? Um, and when we finally got the files, the little girl was gonna be two years old at the time we were adopting her. And um, so I went over there, and and uh, and I was I was excited and confident. I figured, you know, I had I had a PhD in child development. I've read all the research. Like I, I'll I'll be a great dad. Um, and um, uh, after we met our daughter, she didn't want to have anything to do with me, not at all. <laughs> like for weeks, <laughs> and months, and um, you know she hung on to my wife who did not have a phd in child development but <laughs> and um and um but what was so beautiful about those early days was that that i saw that she was quite all right um she was delayed you know in in physical movement and language but but you know we talked about heart um in her heart of hearts she was all right um even though she didn't want to have anything to do with me, she trusted um, her mom and, and, and uh, almost within the same day. And, and, and she knew what it meant to love and to be loved and to trust another human being. Um, and gradually she warmed up to me too. Um, so as a researcher, I had a question then, which is 
why was she all right? Why, 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 why was her, her heart whole? Uh, even though she came from, you know, a, a, a broken place. Um, and, um, and then I think over time, the answer was quite clear because, you know, in the very beginning when we were doing the handoff of the adoption, the person that brought the little girl uh, to us from the orphanage was one of the orphanage caregivers. And so because my daughter would cry if I get even within 200 feet <laughs> of her, so I was interviewing the caregiver um, while she was being comforted by my uh, wife. And she was telling me how, you know, when they brought this premature infant to the orphanage on the first day, they handed that baby girl to her. And then and, and she cared for this child in, in a room, you know, full of other kids for the first two years. And, and the caregiver n knew a lot about this particular little girl and, 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 and kept uh, her eye on the little girl. And so I think it was just so powerful that even in places like an orphanage, even under the working conditions of a caregiver in the orphanage, where one caregiver had to take care of 20, 30 infants at the same time, just that person keeping an extra eye on this little girl has made the difference, right? Between whether or not, you know, that little girl arrives um, full of heart. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think that was probably the beginning of my shifting my work from thinking about, you know, classroom edu education to thinking about what happens in the relationship um, between grown-ups and children and, and, and what is the power of that. I know the second part of your question having to do with what happened the last year, right? And, you know, we, um, I think the biggest change um, the last year is that our human connections got interrupted. Uh, we're so used to being with each other uh, in person, um, in the classroom, at home, not only with children, but with the elderly, right? And so all of these got interrupted. And I think all of us can feel personally what it meant not to be able to see and touch and, and, and hear the voice of somebody. Um, but I think it is also an incredibly powerful reminder that just like I think what I remembered from you know the adoption experience, having at least one person in your life that you can reach out to matters. It doesn't solve all the problems in the world, but it just matters. And if we flip that around, whoever we are, being that at least one person in someone else's life matters that whether we are that person for a neighbor, for an elderly, for a child, or if you can't reach the child, then for the parent, um, but being that at least one person in the lives of another really matters. And, and if we needed any reminder at all, I think the last year was a reminder of that. That's, that's incredible. And, you know, thinking about what you said, Julie, and, and Liz, you talked about this too, um, in terms of the, the respect for children and the respect for fellow educators um, in doing this work. One of the experiences that I had about powerful connections um, that also just happened to be in this, you know, strange year that we're all navigating, um, was the the care and respect and connection I saw between fellow educators. Um, so the, 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 the particular story is, and actually I think it was a couple of years ago, June Lay, that you were you were a keynote actually for in Springfield a couple of years ago for the Reading Success by Fourth Grade Initiative. I had the pleasure of hearing you speak there. And um, because of COVID, and this is you know a wonderful conference that takes place in Springfield um, for educators. And because of COVID, it, it, it couldn't, you know, it couldn't happen um, in person. And, um, you know, it could have been very simple for um, the planners to just decide, you know, it's just not possible. We're just, we just can't, can't do it. Um, but I think 
you know, they knew as educators and administrators that they needed to be there for the educators in this time that was so difficult. There was so much stress and strain as early childhood educators were starting to go back into their centers and classrooms with um, social distancing and capacity and health and safety regulations. Um, and, you know, knowing that, okay, virtual, we sure do have a lot of virtual programs. It's not ideal, but it's a way to connect and it's a way to get together and support each other. And um, it was amazing to see this team of planners take an entire year so um, intricately and thoughtfully plan out a virtual program specifically for early childhood educators. It just happened a couple of weeks ago and almost 600 educators throughout the city of Springfield participated. And that's a testament to um, these planners understanding they needed this space to be able to connect with each other, to hear from each other, to learn from each other, um, to lift each other up at a time when maybe, you know, they were feeling very isolated or not having as many connections and moments as they, they would like to. Um, so I, I just loved, you know, being able to see what, what um, read, reading success by fourth grade and the planners did, you know, they knew, they knew in their heart that they wanted to create this experience and moment for educators, thanking them for the work that they do and the work that they do with, with children throughout our community. Um, yeah, that, that connection heart that we have for each other is so key. As you both speak, I'm watching my students' faces and their reactions, and I'm piecing together things that I know about them personally and how your words are connecting very directly to some things that I, that I know as the educator of these two students. Um, and I've had the pleasure of being their, their professor for a while now and their advisor and they're ready to transition out of the HCC world and into their wider network. And this conversation, students, you know, I hope both of you feel that there are so many people out there that you will continue to connect with um, and build relationships with. Um, and I just wanna take a second, ask if either of you have a reaction that you wanna share to the things that you've heard today, Riley or Jessica. Um, No pressure. <laughs> I'm no pressure, but I see there are both of their wheels turning and I feel like, oh, I think I think they want to talk. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Lee at the beginning when he was kind of talking about like the first question that I had asked, he had mentioned that a lot of people think that the heart and the brain are separate. And I really like how he changed that kind of thought and transitioned it to thinking that they're combined and that they work together to create connection. I really enjoyed that. I could tell Riley, I could tell by your face. <laughs> I really enjoyed just everything that you both said. Um, the stories, the it's, it's something that I'm gonna hold with me forever. And whenever I have a new interaction with with anyone, whether it be a child, an adult, a family, um, I'm gonna think of it completely differently. Um, everybody knows that I'm very like an emotional type of person, so um, this is uh, it's it's great to be able to hear both of you speak about the connections and how it's meaningful to you. Thank you both for your reactions. That was wonderful. Um, Liz, do you want to take us into our closing? So we have a, a thing that we've been doing this, um, this season where we like to close with action steps. And um, this is the second time where I feel moved to just make one on the fly, um, <laughs> which is really to, um, to just remember that, that each of us has the power to form a connection with someone. And one of the things I thought of is to just remember to take a deep breath and, and to just look at that person and notice that they're there. And that you, this is your opportunity to simply notice another person, because ultimately that's what we want is to be seen and to be heard. And so that's my action step suggestion for all of us is to know that 
um, it, it doesn't take some magical skills or powers to, to let someone know that you're there for them and that those moments don't have to last forever either. They can be really short. These are encounters in the grocery store or, um, you know, as a child with the lunch lady and, um, you know, with the janitor as you're walking down the hall and, and that those, those little moments really matter. So the other two action steps that we had thought of was to please go to Simple Interactions website and um, peruse everything there. Um, there's a lot of lovely materials that are accessible to anyone who wants to um, to go to that website and, and, and look at them and learn and watch the videos. And also please visit the Eric Carle Museum website because there's again a lot there, uh, trainings and, and offerings of all kinds. So um, they're, they're worth checking out and uh, thank you so much both of you for being here and to the students for creating such a beautiful episode and if you're on the Eric Crown Museum website you can look for blog posts written by Riley and Jessica last semester because they were both guest bloggers for the museum last semester um, and I'm just so proud of them and it's really nice to see their first service learning project to lead into this one today um, so with that, I want to thank Riley and Jessica and Alexandra who wrote um, the outline for this episode and all the practicum students who have really in-depth discussions in, um, in our seminars to prepare for every episode. They all have these really great discussions to make sure that our questions are getting us some great conversation. So thank you, practicum students. You continue to amaze me. Um, and a thank you to Dr. Lee and to Courtney, both for being here today, um, your time with the students and your dedication to this field um, and all of your work that you do. So thank you both for being here. And um, last but not least, thank you to HCC Marketing for who edit and <laughs> caption and promote all of our videos. Um, we're so grateful. Um, so thank you. Today was the ABCs and HCCs heart-centered collaborations. Bye. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sheila, Liz, Courtney. Nice to see you. Thank you. Bye, Jessica. Thank you. Very nice to get to know you. Mm -hmm.